first of all, thanks everyone for watching and or listening and joining us on our first episode. I'm very excited to kick off the Money Morning podcast with a killer guest. His name is Lee Travers. Now, Lee is uh, Executive Director of Digital X, which is an ASX-listed company, which is particularly focused on a range of blockchain initiatives, which includes a Bitcoin fund. So, Lee, how are you going? Yeah, really well. Uh, it's obviously a great time for our market at the moment, with over the weekend Bitcoin hitting all-time highs again, US $60,000. So, yeah, good start to the week here. Yeah, definitely. There's certainly a lot of interest in cryptocurrency generally. Um, those all-time highs are definitely drawing people's attention. And it's sort of this sort of feedback loop where another all-time high brings more investors in. And we're really starting to see things take off. Uh, last time I checked, DigitalX holds uh, a bit over 200 Bitcoin. Is, is, and that's really intriguing. Uh, and is that correct, Lee? Well, yes, we've had Bitcoin in our balance sheet since 2017 first public company to do so, while well, we've seen a few others have uh, have joined that list recently. Because, uh, DigitalX has held them on the balance sheet since 2017. Um, the number on our balance sheet is 215. We also have an additional exposure to 215 in the Bitcoin fund. And then we also have units in the diversified basket as well, uh, which has a, around at the moment a 40% ownership in in bitcoin per the portfolio so you know the number is is north of 431 um you know 440 something like that i'd, I'd estimate um as as total exposure to bitcoin yeah wow that's that's right on that's quite intriguing um that you've because a lot of people uh they they recommend 40 50 percent exposure to bitcoin so i actually didn't know about that uh basket of currencies that you mentioned just before so, yeah, I think that's absolutely fascinating. And I guess what I'm going to ask you now is the stuff that's on everyone's mind. Uh, you know, Elon Musk, uh, he set the cryptosphere alight. Uh, he had some big quotes come out. And then Tesla actually revealed in an SEC filing that they have made a significant investment in Bitcoin. So I guess that would have been pretty exciting to watch uh, that impact on your balance sheet. And uh, I guess what, what are your thoughts on uh, the Musk phenomenon then? Yeah, I, I think you know more to who was buying, why they were buying was really what excited me. You know, the price moves up and down, but ultimately we're here for the long term. So we want to see that there's legitimate long term support for Bitcoin as as really a driver into into what we're doing. And uh, obviously, Tesla first element is they're looking to accept Bitcoin as payment for Teslas for the vehicles, which I think is really clever given a huge number of tech investors. Tesla supporters are also into Bitcoin. Um, so that makes sense to accept that as currency and then strategically to have that as part of their balance sheet. Um, I think it's around 7.7% of their cash holding. And you know, that number, if worst case scenario, Bitcoin happened to fall back significantly, it's not going to impact their operations too significantly, but it certainly diversifies that cash holding that's being devalued you know, circa 15% per year with the, the money printing we're seeing. Public companies, they do need to hold a large chunk of cash. Otherwise, they're seen as come raise and they'll trade at a discount to their net value. They really can't buy other companies because then they're seeing as that company's you know, better value. Um, they don't buy gold. They don't buy a diversified basket of you know, companies via an index or something. So having another alternative that's not going to devalue as part of that core treasury is something that Tesla's taken on board. Um, I think MicroStrategy, uh, which is a, a software and now an investment business that's listed on the NASDAQ, helped create a bit of a blueprint for public companies over there and how they could then you know, structure that investment legally, file it uh, appropriately, and then also get their board across from a due diligence and governance perspective. So yeah, the blueprint's been laid and to see what is the world's most popular company uh, acquire Bitcoin, put it on the balance sheet, I think we're only going to see a number more come through in the short term. And uh, potentially that is something that's going to you know, move into additional markets too. I saw in the AFR last week, there was a report, you know, circa three reasons why you should consider it as a company over here. And, and one of those reasons was risk mitigation. So okay. yeah, didn't think we'd see that come through so quickly, but certainly pleasing to do so. It is 
absolutely irresponsible to have a very large cash holding as a company at the moment, given you know the value of cash is, is decreasing quite quickly relative to the performance that investors want. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, this has been a recurring theme in our editorials is uh, sort of the broader monetary policy dynamics out there and the devaluation of currency. And I guess, and I, I'll get to that in just a moment, but what I'm really interested to hear is what's your view of the institutional sentiment out there right now for crypto generally and Bitcoin? And I guess, how, how are you seeing that play into the dynamics of your own business? Well, in terms of the institutional side, it is uh, geographic dependent. So Australia is still relatively quiet compared to what's happened out of the US, which when it broke 20,000, which was the previous all-time high, was really a signal for those institutions that you know Bitcoin is here to stay. There are very few assets in the history of time that have gone down 80% and then have gone back to go and perform and, and record all-time highs. And that really signals the assets here to stay for the long term. So it makes sense to come into the marketplace when it's up from there. So we've gone from 20,000 to 60,000, a three times increase. And uh, you know, relative to the allocations these institutions have made, it's tiny. It's not like 2017 when it was dominated by retail investors that were overexposed and you know, looking to create a, a quick trade and generate a quick profit. This time it's part of a diversified portfolio. It's part of portfolio allocation. And typically the numbers are 1% or less. And these positions are going to increase over time as investors become more and more comfortable with doing so. Going through a due diligence process in the months means that uh, it's not something you're looking to, to trade for a short-term price difference, given its historical volatility. It just doesn't make sense. Yep. So yeah, I expect that um, that first wave of institutions we've seen has, has really just reduced the risk for other institutions to come in. And then as the market matures and we get uh, better products, such as um, you know funds like the DigitalX fund, which is priced at net asset value, which reduces the risk relative to the previous sort of fa- flavor of the month being um, the Grayscale fund. Uh, yep. that I've seen um, you know has taken 20 plus billion dollars of market share, currently trades at a, a significant discount. Um, as those sort of products are improved into the market, makes them more accessible for investors then you'd see more traditional investors come in. Um, with the fund that we've built over here, um, we've actually been able to get that on two wealth management platforms, um, being PowerApp and NetWealth. And that really makes it a lot more accessible for institutions, as well as to understand that there's you know, significant due diligence that's taken place over the product. And uh, that's really helping with our adoption. The, the first six months, um, was really about educating and making the product, um, I guess, aware to financial advisors and their networks. And that, you know, that was positive in the sense that we saw traction was going to come. And the last sort of six months plus has actually been, you know, more pleasing in terms of monthly inflows coming through consistently every two weeks um, and, and growing the fund with those new investment flows and obviously growing the fund with the, uh, the appreciation in uh, Bitcoin and digital assets. So, yeah, I think it certainly is improving. Um, hopefully, there's an ability to improve the product over time, whether that's uh, more frequent liquidity, whether that's a potential listing, whether that's opening it up to retail investors. There's sort of some of the theme, themes that we're thinking about just okay. to improve that accessibility and, uh, and make it uh, broadly more aware and more accessible to Australian investors. Yeah, nice one. Um, because we all want to see uh, asset appreciation. and it's in, I've been actually following your company for a number of years, Lee, and um, one of the things you kept on plugging away while uh, the the Bitcoin price was quite low, and uh, and and it was interesting that you're actually working on this product offering prior to the Musk comments and and the the media hype. So I guess you were you're well ahead of the the game in in that respect. Um, but I I just have a strange question to ask you uh, because. When, when you talk about due diligence uh, from fund managers and that sort of thing, and it actually being Bitcoin being uh, allocated to a portfolio as, as uh, you know, it, with cash slowly losing its, well, quickly losing its value. Um, I guess my question is, I, I pitched this to Money Morning readers a while back, and it's the idea that certain crypto and Bitcoin could be actually eventually viewed as a sort of risk off asset. 
as opposed to a risk on speculative play. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that, um, because there are a lot uh, there there are a lot of uh, cryptos out there that offer s- sort of yield through staking and things like that. I was just wondering what your thoughts are on, I guess, when you've got this basket of currencies, that particular offering. Uh, do you sort of look to stabilize the portfolio that you've got with that, with certain, I guess, yield generating cryptos? And I guess what what's your outlook for the sort of risk off nature of crypto in in the future, in, instead of just this risk on speculative thing, which many people are sort of assuming it is. Yeah, and no, I think um, you raise a good point there. It has moved from um, a, I guess, a, a speculative investment to that safe haven aspect, aspect digital gold. But um, yeah, I guess the, the summary of a recent report I read from Citigroup, several hundred pages they put out, was that oh, wow. big Bitcoin represents an inflation hedge, a portfolio diversifier, and a safe haven not currently available through traditional government bonds all at once. And I just couldn't explain it any better than that. The yeah. fact that it has you know, a, a number of characteristics that are not available from any investment previously, and it's completely digital, um, means that it's open up to a, a huge range of new investors that are going to prefer it over the analog version. We've seen it time and time again with uh, digital options that are replacing the traditional analog version. And it doesn't always just replace an existing market. It can make it uh, exponentially more valuable as well. So there's, there's a lot more upside than I think just of the gold market and what yeah. uh, investors are saying that it could replace. It's a digital version, transferable anywhere in the world. It performs a lot of the functions that gold does uh, yeah. in terms of, terms of being that, that safe haven asset terms of being that potential store of value than, um, than gold does. So I think there's a lot more upside to it as well. Um, in, ter- in terms of us, you know, how we're looking at it is um, you know, a, a way to, to really store assets for the long term, but, but grow them given how early we are in the cycle. Um, we aren't generating any yield from Bitcoin uh, through the Bitcoin fund. Uh, we found the investors just want to have the safest way to, to own Bitcoin, to invest in Bitcoin. So what we've got that structured in is a, a cold storage solution with a multi-billion dollar custodian that's SEC registered. Um, we've been able to get access to their group insurance as well because of how yep. secure the Bitcoins are held. Um, we do know there's alternatives out there in the market that'll offer you, you know, between three and, and 6% for Bitcoin. But they don't do it out of the goodness of their own heart, obviously. There is yeah, yeah. someone else they're lending it to <laughs> that's generating greater returns than that. And if you're generating greater returns than 6%, you're obviously taking some risk. Um, yeah. What sort of levels of those risk, you know, that's not always um, easily understood. Um, you know, my sort of nut market sources are telling me that a lot of those Bitcoin lenders have engaged in the grayscale arb trade. Um, oh, yep. As you remember, Grayscale was trading at a sort of 10 to 30% premium to net asset. So if you have Bitcoin, you can effectively hedge that, invest in the Grayscale fund. After six months, your escrow period ends, you unwind that transaction okay. um, and clip the premium. However, okay. it became such a crowded trade that it now trades at a 10% discount. Uh, so given that was the most popular way to generate a yield on Bitcoin, and now it's causing a, a pretty significant loss. I would say that um, there may be a bit of market contagion around or a bit of systematic risk because of that effectively one-way trade that most of the, the marketplace were taking. Um, but uh, yeah, we certainly haven't done that. Okay. Uh, w- with the diversified basket though, absolutely, we're looking at, at greater ways to generate returns um, without taking too much risk. Okay. So, no, that, that sounds very sensible. I mean, because because we're, we're you're, you're probably aware of, in fact, I'm sure you're aware of uh, the sort of uh, DeFi movement out there and sort of the idea of uh, not just seeing capital appreciation, but also getting a reward for staking. And, and then there, there are things like Yearn, you know, there's, there's a whole ecosystem out there to explore. Um, so I guess my next question is something you touched on just before about risk and uh, gold, actually, because because Musk said, uh, you know, he views Bitcoin as cash, not gold. And I thought that was a really interesting comment of his. So I guess 
my next question is, uh, could you tell us a bit more about that Exfoliant product of yours and uh, how that fits into your overall product mix? Because a lot of people still have a taste for gold and, uh, and I'm generally bullish on gold's long-term prospects. So I'd, I'd just be curious to hear what uh, your company's doing with Exfoliant. Yeah, brilliant. So Digilex has got the funds management arm. We've also got the blockchain development arm. So we've got a very talented team of blockchain developers that have got a heap of experience. And we had a, a bullion business that had approached us. Um, it's based out of Sydney called Jagged. It's the oldest rare coin and bullion merchant in Australia. They had a business that was predominantly selling from the storefront and they wanted to find a way to move digital. And with uh, effectively what we've been able to structure there on the blockchain side is investors can now buy into gold bullion at a fraction of the cost there, what they could previously do it. Um, and they can also get access to gold bullion that's both audited, insured, and vaulted, and vaulted uh, in a really secure fashion. So it's a really secure way of buying gold bullion at a lower cost than you could previously do so. And it's also transferable anywhere in the world from as little as one gram of gold. So wow. really, really interesting product in the sense that it, it's changing up a market that's been you know, running for hundreds of years and using new technology to do so. So we're obviously pleased to be able to you know, build the, the technology stack for that business. Uh, gold is the first offering um, from the manager, which is actually called Bullion Asset Management out of Singapore. Um, yep. Silver is most likely to come down the pipe very, very shortly. Um, and there's certainly other products as well that you know, that business could effectively help tokenize or um, offer the ability to invest as a, a fraction in a, a previous, you know, larger, larger sized offering. Um, I would note the most recent capital raise they did, um, yep. it was actually led by an ASX listed gold developer, okay. Data Gold Mines. So there's potential there uh, for a number of things, you know, how gold developers could actually get it further involved with the gold supply chain. So yep. obviously dividends are currently paid currently in cash by the banking system. Yep. You know, what, what's the potential to potentially look at, you know, paying dividends via gold uh, to investors' wallets rather than to investors' bank accounts? Oh, wow. um, how do you fund uh, undeveloped gold resources? Well, we know there's a massive institutional market for funding gold resources via streaming and royalties agreements where the end investor gets paid back in um, physical gold. Uh, so when you've got a digital version that can um, simplify that whole process, make it far more efficient, completely yeah. auditable, um, yeah, it just really sort of opens up the possibilities for that business and something pretty exciting there that we're helping to lead. Wow. Well, I mean... I guess uh, I've got two points to make about that kind of thing is that, first of all, blockchain sort of got this naturally democratizing feature to it in that it, uh, it, it, it sort of, it, it opens up the possibilities for more fine grained transactions. And, you know, we've, we've seen certain, I won't, I won't dig too far into it, but we've seen certain sort of uh, financial revolutions take place recently in the US um, where retail investors feel that they are not getting a fair slice of the pie. And I guess the, the next thing I was going to bring up was in relation to that, which is if you're sort of slowly moving into increasingly different types of tokenized assets, um, do, you, do, you think, do you think there's a potential out there for sort of tokenized securities? Uh, because the ASX was recently down, I believe, this year. And then the, the Nikkei in, uh, in Japan also had a major outage towards the end of last year. Do you, do you see there's, a, and your company's got this sort of uh, foot in both the crypto world and the ASX. I, I guess my question to you is, what, what do you think the outlook is for, I guess, a decentralization of everything uh, at some point? And I guess I'm curious to, th so, uh, I'm curious to hear what you think the, um, the most likely assets to be tokenized will be in, in a sort of cascading way. Yeah, I think generally we're going to move to the digitization of most investment products in the future. It just makes a lot more sense. You've got the ledger and the ability to store the investment in one rather than having you know, ledgers that are then reconciled against the actual investment holdings. Um, and you've got uh, inefficiencies throughout that, throughout that entire process. You know, in this, 
you know, what, 2021, we're still de- dealing in an age where you need to show your broker an original copy of an unrestricted share certificate when you're buying an international stock. Yeah. It's just completely bizarre that you have to post into their PO box, like how this market is, is still that efficient is, is quite yeah. staggering. It's because those industry incumbents have been making significantly outsized returns for many, many years, and they're not yeah. incentivized to change it. So we know that there's a massive market opportunity. We know it's moving digital. It's just a matter of time. I think, you know, with the ASX sort of going down, that was pretty abnormal share trading that we saw yeah. during March in terms of the volume increases. So I'm certainly not going to sit here and say if it was on Ethereum and you saw a you know, 20 or 30 times increase in volumes, then, you know, a blockchain yeah. system could handle it better. That's just not the case. Yeah. Um, I but... wasn't trying to pigeonhole you there. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think it is fascinating to think at sort of a meta level about these broad changes to the uh, entire financial system that I think yeah. will eventually take place. Um, it's just a sort of matter of pace of change. And uh, and that was sort of where I was going with that. Um, yeah, I, I think... I think with that sort of really highlighted the example I like to sort of see was um, Robin Hood. Yeah. Where you had all the traders coming in behind, you know, one stock that identified was, you know, heavily shorted. Um, and they had a particular affinity for, for supporting due to, you know, I guess some general support for that business. They liked it. Yeah. Um, and what that was, was Robin Hood as a fintech, you know, built on top of existing market infrastructure with existing market licenses, yeah. with existing incumbents that were funding the business, being Citadel Capital. Yeah. So that really led to the similar result happening in that institutions won that round um, yeah. because you're using the same infrastructure, same licensing, and the same money was supporting it all. You don't have that with decentralized finance. It is different market infrastructure, different licensing, and different investors that are backing it. So you're not gonna have the same result as what you had before. And I think that's, for me, probably the most exciting thing, just seeing that sort of evolution from traditional market incumbents to uh, sort of new investors that are supporting technology and are ahead of the curve using the brains rather than you know using the yeah. incumbency and the seats they've already or always had. Um, so I think that revolution is probably uh, the, the biggest defining element of um, uh, you know, Ethereum and digital assets generally. Yeah, and heaven forbid we suggest that sometimes emotions play a role in your investments as opposed to just pure rationality. And then, you know, whether that rationality is uh, is is sort of driven by emotion in the first place. I, I come from a philosophy background, so uh, this whole sort of investment narrative that's playing out, I think is it's really interesting to see not just uh, how emotions and reasons play out, but also uh, power dynamics and incumbency, which you, you mentioned before. So. Um, that's all very fascinating, but I won't delve too much into that. I'm, what I'm really curious to hear about is this drawbridge uh, product that you, you'll be offering. And I believe that's a reg tech product. So I was hoping you could just give uh, listeners or watchers that don't know uh, a bit of insight into what reg tech is and I guess the specifics of this drawbridge product. Absolutely. So reg tech is just using technology to solve regulatory problems. Typically, businesses have to manage their their regulatory issues um, you know via a process often that can be paper based can be manual can be error prone when digitizing that entire solution and workflow eliminates risk eliminates errors and obviously gives those participating in that market a lot more confidence that things are being done appropriately and that's an element where drawbridge fits in for us it helps public companies manage their securities trading policies so interestingly, with Australia's you know plus two thousand companies, um, they have directors all on board, key management personnel, and and typically a significant portion of staff that are subject to their securities dealing policies. And those policies are something that investors and shareholders uh, sort of are on boarded with. Um, and then it's a case that they're required to follow that. If they don't, there's significant reputational issues. For directors as well as reputational issues for companies. Yeah. Um, the way that it's done is often on the back of that securities trading policy is a form that you'll t- you'll write in your details to get approval. You know, 
scan that into the company secretary or chairman board will approve it and then you'll have approval to trade afterwards and then the uh, company will have a, a notification that goes through you know via the registry once that um, transaction is completed two days afterwards and you know in a world that is now moving digital um, where corporate governance has never been a bigger focus that simply isn't yeah. good enough um, we, we're not seeing you know, anything else in the market uh, as, as offering this sort of solution and that's what we want to bring to to market so we actually just launched that in november yeah. um, we're already signing up public companies now that are using it on boarding with it and looking to expand that to you know other public companies throughout Australia. Um, yeah. But effectively, the, the vision for this product is to be the digital governance standard, you know, for the world's six hundred thousand plus publicly yeah. traded companies. And as we see more and more global securities exchanges like the ASX offer uh, digital settlement and clearing via the way of um, we see ASX moving to a DLT based, based solution. Yeah. You know, this drawbridge solution will become more and more compatible for other public companies as well. So, yeah, it's really, really exciting product in the sense that it um, doesn't really have any competitors at the moment. And it is solving a problem that is growing in terms of that, that corporate governance yeah. compliance focus for public companies uh, using a digital solution. And yeah, really exciting to see that come to market at the moment. Well, nice one, because I, I think we, we all know that there's uh quite a bit of friction in, in this environment and, and efficiency is really important, but also the compliance aspect of things is, is critical to reputational issues, as you said. And, uh, and I guess I, coming from my educational background, I actually trust paper less than a ledger. So I think that's mm -hmm. a really interesting uh, insight into how clunky the current system is um, when it comes to share trading policies and things like that. Um, but on a different note, I, I want to ask you, because a lot of governments are uh, sort of looking at central bank backed digital currencies right now. And I, I want this to sort of be a, a sort of capstone on the discussion, because I'm very intrigued by where these these uh, particular types of currencies are going to take us and uh, how that will interact with cryptocurrencies as well, um, because uh, a lot of well. I mean, just for a little history lesson for our our uh, listeners and and readers is the sort of when Nixon took the uh, U.S. U.S. off the gold standard, uh, the Fed wire system was implemented, and uh, you know we we no longer pegged our currency to gold, and now we have a floating currency, and I guess the next big sort of quantum leap for uh, government based currency or fiat will be this central bank backed digital currency, which I believe is already on the move in China, and they're mm -hmm. using a lot of uh, promotional activities to set up a digital yuan and uh, renminbi. So I guess my, my question to you is, how do you see central bank-backed digital currencies interacting with the crypto world? Um, I called it techno-monetary competition in some of my editorials. And I think you know we'll see corporate, corporate digital currencies, but they won't be true crypto. And I guess, uh, the, the main question is, uh, how do you see all these different new forms of money interacting? Because I think that's um, an exciting but potentially risky uh, clash that could take place. And um, I guess how Digital X is positioning itself in that environment. Yeah, I think, um, I think you might have nailed it there. Techno monetary <laughs> competition. Oh, you've that, never that, heard of that? <laughs> no, I think it's brilliant though. I mean, yeah. that's that's effectively where the competition is, right? So yeah. on the technology side, I guess from, from my point of view, I see that technology now is, is absolutely being capable um, and making a lot more sense for why you'd rather your currency as a central bank uh, for being on that ledger. Um, first one is obviously you know, helping to eliminate that sort of black economy where there is uh, untraceable transactions and you're missing out on taxation. Yeah. Um, the the other one is sort of around that smart contract, smart payments, where you know potentially you have the ability to you know take the GST as it's applied to every single transaction, and you could even change the the taxation system so rather than being so income based, it could be consumption based as well. So you're getting that uh, that taxation at the point of transaction, um, really sort of speeding up that process, and then. 
you know, eliminating some of those uh, tax risks for those that uh, are holding you know, large tax liabilities through different periods. Um, but then on the monetary side, that's where the competition is. Yeah. Uh, it's not a case if we see all central bank currencies move to a you know, digital uh, ledger technology, distributed ledger technology, that they're going to replace Bitcoin. It's because they have vastly different monetary policies. Yeah. So you know, it's effectively undefined how many AUD, Australian dollars, will be out in the market in 10 or 20 years' time. Um, same with US dollars, same with every other central bank issued currency based on the central bank board and what they'd like to put out, yep. uh, which is a little scary. And oh, yeah. that's why we've seen such wild changes in the markets this year because of the massive amount of new dollars that are coming down and flooding into marketplaces. Yep. With, with Bitcoin, you actually don't have that. You have a defined finite currency. Um, that has a schedule of supply that this year and for the next few years will be as scarce as gold, around 1.5% increase in supply, yep. uh, which will then halve in 2024. So it'll be the most scarce out there. And, um, and certainly scarce asset, scarce money is something better to hold than one that's being rapidly inflated. I've heard numbers as high as 40% extra US dollars will have um, you know, since COVID in that yep. 12 months post that. So yeah, just massive amounts of money yeah, that we're seeing yeah, increasing yeah. in that supply. And yeah, that's where that sort of monetary competition is at. Um, Ethereum, which is uh, another really interesting technology product with Ether as their currency, they actually just had a vote uh, on some changes to okay. the Ethereum protocol. And what that's going to do is help uh, define what the finite number of Ether will be in circulation, yeah. as well as have a model where transaction fees and, and new issuance is actually um, burned. So consider that as like a buyback if you're looking at traditional yeah. stocks. So not only are you going to move to a finite supply, you're also going to reduce, um, come to a reducing supply because some of that's being bought back and potentially a you know, technology investment like Ether is going to become more of a monetary one as well, more of a store of value asset because of those changes uh, on the monetary side. Um, so yeah. how's how's digital X involved? Well, you know we consider both Bitcoin, um, Ethereum, and other other digital assets as having those you know store of value type um, investment characteristics. And then from a you know potential for a uh, digital gold currency, because one yeah. of the major challenges around having gold is that it's uh, not very divisible um, and very difficult to transfer anywhere. Now X bullion you know solves for that. It is now transferable down to one gram, divisible down to one gram and transferable anywhere in the world. So yeah. there's a, a potential solution that you know, for those that um, aren't into Bitcoin or other digital assets, um, but certainly are into gold and its scarcity profile or mining profile or just prefer something that's been around for hundreds of years oh, for yeah. their store of value, um, but uh, are concerned about holding um, central bank issued currency at this you know, current market environment. Oh, then yeah. uh, the next bullions are potential offering for them too. Yeah, well, it's very interesting. You got you your foot in both the, the there's sort of like two deflationary forces, right? Uh, the 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 Bitcoin hardening events uh, increase market scarcity, and then well, there's only enough uh, gold in the ground to last X amount of time. So the the finiteness of things is really quite interesting to think of at a sort of conceptual level, and. Um, yeah, I, I think it's very fascinating that you've got these two different offerings, both appealing to the same thing. Um, I sort of, went a, a, maybe about a year ago, I, I noticed that uh, Bitcoin and gold were sort of tracking up at the same time. And then, you know, obviously, there, there's been a divergence. The, the gold price has gone down, whereas Bitcoin's powering to all-time highs. I called it the, uh, the trust quotient. So it's sort of this idea that uh, the trust or distrust that people have of uh, government currency um, is, is sort of, you can track it in the prices of gold and, and, uh, and a variety of cryptos. So it's, it's absolutely fascinating that uh, the, the two are going up and then we've seen this divergence. I still think uh, gold for traditional, I think there are demographics at play in, the term, in terms of who wants to invest in gold 
and who wants to invest in crypto, I would sort of gently suggest that maybe older generations prefer gold. It's, it's well known. It's been around for, well, millennia. And then uh, crypto is sort of viewed as uh, something suited to younger people. So regardless of where you sit on those demographics, uh, you know, both, both of those uh, sort of deflationary things are uh, capable to be catered for by, by your particular business. So um, I think that's, that's absolutely fascinating. And, uh, and I know you've, you've got a, a capital raise in place. Um, so you'll be advancing these projects uh, probably more aggressively over the coming months, which uh, I'll be very interested to, to watch. Um, do you have any uh, final comments, Lee? Uh, I might just wrap this up. I'm, I'm conscious that people only have so much time and uh, I've really enjoyed this chat. Uh, do you have any, anything to say at the end here? Because I mean, this has been absolutely fascinating for me. I'm, I'm very much into the crypto and, uh, and I'm excited to just have this conversation. Um, so, so yeah, if, if you've got anything at the end to say here, um, I'd, I'd love to hear it. I think just, um, just to sort of recap on the DigitalX offering, it's the, the funds management side where it's Bitcoin, nine other leading digital assets that we can offer to qualified investors to invest in safely and securely. Uh, we've got the development side where we're actually using the technology because we consider there's a tremendous amount of value that businesses will generate from using blockchain-based technology. And having launched Drawbridge late last year gives us a great platform to grow that side of the company. Um, and then just from that uh, you know, sort of uh, macro investment offering, um, where do investors look to generate sort of safe haven ass assets and, and also some upside, um, both sort of that gold and Bitcoin store value assets like that uh, is a place where well and truly positioned uh, after having done the recent capital raising, which was out of the US market yeah. at a 2% discount to market. Um, I think that was sort of really pleasing and should help us accelerate that growth over the next part of the year. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, finally, I, I just really want to thank you for coming on. Uh, this is our first podcast. Uh, hopefully there haven't been too many kinks. And uh, I, I really enjoyed this chat and I, I look forward to talking to, to more people of your caliber, Lee. Thanks, Lachlan. Yeah, great podcast. And thanks for having me on the show. Okay, thanks, Lee. You have a good day. You too. Cheers. Okay, see you, mate. Bye.